let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, creator, and chief cat herder. And I'm delighted to see so many of you here to talk about what is one of the most important subjects in higher education. But before I proceed, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the forum. I'd like to explain the forum, give you some background, and then I'll introduce this week's excellent guest. I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, to bring this week's guest up. Uh, Sonia is a professor at Appalachian State University, uh, where she specializes in higher education administration and has a laser-like focus on student experience. So first of all, welcome. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Uh, we're delighted that you could make it. Thank you so much. Now, because it's June, it's customary on the program to ask one of the great burning questions of our time, which is, what's the weather like there? So. Um, it's hot uh, and kind of muggy. It's been raining. So it's um, a mix of things, but we are generally in the late 80s, mm -hmm. uh, or upper 80s, lower 90s, um, oh, and a hot. So I work at App State, which is up in the mountains, but I don't live in the mountains. So I live yeah. kind of at the base of the mountains. So, oh, yeah. uh, so I still, you know, I'm from Louisiana. So humid and hot is not new to me. Um, so I'm fine with it. I was going to say, just, uh, you know, comparing it to Louisiana. We have a couple of connections. I told you I worked in Shreveport for a while, but also uh, uh, Vanessa Vale says that she lived in um, Vidreen. Is it Vidreen or Vidreen? It's Vidreen. Um, and I think uh, she was talking about being from Lafayette, which is like about 45 minutes uh, away from my hometown, uh, but it's where we would go for a movie, the mall, those sorts of things, uh, an airport. Um, so it's about uh, 45 minutes from my parents' house. Well, I'm glad that, um, I'm glad to hear that, and we can we can uh, compare notes on on Louisiana in a bit. Um, but I'm especially glad uh, that you're doing this work at uh, Appalachian State. So uh, tell us, looking ahead to the the next say you know eight ten months or so, what's going to be taking up most of your time, <clears throat> and what are the big topics that you're really going to be focusing on? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm working on several kind of research and writing projects this summer uh, that are kind of a continuation of my existing research agenda uh, with multiple different kind of research teams. So kind of colleagues all over the country. But uh, primarily, um, I'm working with a colleague, Dr. Georgiana Martin, who's at the University of Georgia. Um, and she and I are co-editing um, a book uh, with Stylist Publishing, uh, focusing on uh, supports for poor and working class students in higher education. Um, so it's an edited volume. We have about 28 chapters. Uh, so that manuscripts actually do at the end of the month. So we're hoping for a spring 21 release uh, on that uh, new text, um, which we're excited about um, because it's uh, faculty and practitioners who are writing about the good things that are happening at their two-year and four-year institutions all across mm. uh, the United States. And so hoping that other institutions can scale uh, from those examples, um, particularly as we think about um, how um, both COVID, but also the racial injustices that are happening in the United, or continue to happen, they're, they're not new, uh, mm -hmm. happening in the United States exacerbate um, some of the issues that already exist around social class identity in the U.S. And so uh, knowing that um, when we layer social class and race, right, we have uh, amplified dynamics there as well as we we have amplified dynamics if we layer first gen and social class or rural and social class um, and some of those pieces. Um, I'm also working on a volume uh, for the New Directions for Student Leadership series uh, with a colleague, uh, Dr. Kathy Guthrie, who's at Florida State, uh, which is on looking at how are we... Uh, teaching leadership, um, both in terms of kind of like theory and practice uh, through the lens of social class. And so again, another social class component mm -hmm. there um, and working on several projects um, with um, some different colleagues um, on rural and rurality and what does that mean? So uh, with my colleague at App State, Dr. Andrew Karisic, uh, we're working on a rural transfer project. And then uh, he and I are also on a team uh, led by Dr. Darius Means at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, looking more broadly at COVID and rural students. So we're hoping to get a grant uh, on that. Um, so various things. Uh, there's a team of folks, there's 10 of us who are working on a new project specifically on first generation college students as well. So most of my work falls into the bucket of social class, first gen, um, and uh, rurality um, and how that impacts college access and college success. Well, that's fantastic. That's such vital work right now. Uh, badly, badly needed. One quick question. What is uh, rural transfer? Does it mean transferring between rural colleges? Yeah. So we um, how we conceptualized uh, that study specifically was that we are looking at students who um, define their background as rural um, and that they're transferring from either two year to four year 
four mm -hmm. year, four year or two year to two year. So basically they're just shifting their institutional um, kind of position. Um, and so we're, it's a mixed method study. So Dr. Kritich is looking at kind of distance elasticity um, with the transfer pieces. So, you know, how far are students transferring? Why, you know, all of those sorts of things from the quantitative perspective. And then I um, conducted the interviews with the students um, that are in the study um, to follow up and talk about what does it mean to be rural? How has that impacted their transfer experience? Uh, those sorts of things, especially right now that we may see coming into the fall um, that uh, students are either transferring from an existing institution to a two year or they're starting at a two year and then want to transfer later. You know, this is so vital. I mean, that's something that people normally don't pay a lot of attention to, and famously is a, a hobble on uh, community colleges who, you know, succeed by transfers, but are often punished with statistics for that. Mm -hmm. uh, friends, I have all kinds of questions uh, with which to bombard our, our, our poor guest, um, and I just want to start off with a couple, but I would love to hear from you. I mean, that's the purpose of this forum, is for your questions and comments. So already she's just laid out a whole series of crucial topics, everything from transfer to what it means to be a rural student, to the gap between two and four year institutions, to poverty, first generation, racial status. Um, please think of your questions, and again, either Click the raised hand if you want to join us up here on stage, or just you know type it into the question mark, and we'll be glad to hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions I'd like to ask is: Looking ahead to this time next year, how is COVID nineteen changing the student experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's so hard to predict, um, and so it's interesting. So I teach uh, master students who are studying to be university administrators, so to run residence halls, to run activities, to be academic advisors, um, all of those sorts of roles at the institution. Um, and obviously in the past several months have had to uh, get really creative in how to continue providing that student experiences um, to the different populations of students and having students want that, they crave it. They don't, um, you know, there are some students who don't, absolutely, but the majority of students are wanting to have some kind of uh, connection to their peers, to the campus, um, to faculty and administrators who work there. Um, and so I think that as we go into the fall, it's going to be different. Um, even campuses that are saying, you know, uh, we're back open and we're going to, you know, move along. Um, I think it's going to look very different um, in terms of, you know, we're not having concerts, right, um, in society right now. Well, campuses generally have concerts as part of their welcome week or the those sorts of things, that's probably not going to happen. Um, whereas some students are used to moving into their residence hall with either a roommate of their selection or a potluck roommate, uh, that might not be happening, right? We might have to go to single rooms based on CDC guidelines or where it was a, a triple, it's now, you know, a double or like those sorts of things. So it's going to be different. Um, I think also, you know, students will still want um, to have spaces to share ideas and share experiences. And so, um, I've been working with some organizations um, that specifically work with fraternities and sororities. And like, what does that look like uh, in terms of recruitment for those organizations, which are traditionally face to face? Um, and so they're having to get real creative to say, how can we do this? And so on the back end, we're kind of working um, with our colleagues to say, yes, and you can't just rely on, oh, well, I know Brian, so I'm going to invite Brian to join my organization because if I'm a first generation college student and I don't have all those hometown kind of connections or kind of the social capital, if you will, then I'm going to miss out on opportunity that might be really right for my like learning and connection to campus. So um, while we're getting creative, we also have to keep top of mind equity issues in how we provide uh, opportunities and spaces um, for students to connect with each other and to get that sense of belonging to their campus. So in a year from now, I would imagine or hope that some of that stuff would have returned to more face-to-face. -face. Um, and so I feel like we're going to do some things that are going to be stopgap um, so that organizations can continue to, sh to exist uh, on our campuses. But I think stu what students crave is particularly students who are choosing um, or able to choose really um, a four year um, campus kind of residential experience. They want to have some of those things. And so they want to go back and have meetings of their um, student organizations and have campus-based events, that's going to be scaled back for the fall. But the hope is by this time next year that we will be ramping up kind of for on-campus orientation options in addition to maybe some continuation of virtual options, uh, welcome weeks that are kind of full full fledged back, those sorts of things, because students still crave that as much as we want to say that they don't, they do. The research shows it. Uh, anecdotally, conversations with students show it. And so the hope would be to have um, some continuation, but also maybe all thinking about how we can 
take what's good out of the innovation and, and virtual kind of remote options we also have in place. That's an awful lot. Uh, f f thank you. Thank you. Um, I can see why um, they put you in charge of uh, teaching um, uh, university administrators because you've got so much information here. Um, a couple of quick questions about that. Um, one is, uh, how do you see these changes impacting the finances of colleges and universities? Yep. And all these changes are going to cost money. Yes. Um, it's And it's in some ways it's things that we can't even expect. So, you know, in the state of North Carolina, for example, we haven't passed a state budget. Um, and so we have been kind of operating as a state uh, right. for the past, well, we haven't passed a budget yet this cycle. And so um, already we were unsure of kind of what that looked like. And then when we add to it the kind of um, uncertainty uh, about all the things. And so if we want, are going to put, I saw, was it Purdue? Some One campus was doing like, crowdfunding uh, to try to get screens, uh, like classic screens for the classroom, similar to how we've had them now at the grocery store and those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, so each one of those, if you think about how many classrooms are on a campus, two year, four year, et cetera, and every single one needs one, what does that mean? If we, you know, are we gonna use fac them in faculty offices? Are we not, um, are you know, people gonna continue teaching online because of how the space is arranged on a, on a campus that says, okay, well, our classroom usually seats 25, we can only have 12. Well, what does that mean? Um, and then you mentioned earlier high flex teaching, which I think is uh, incredibly interesting um, and not necessarily something as a faculty member I want to do because I think that it also creates an inequitable learning environment sometimes because you can say, you know, Brian gets to come this week, Sanja gets to come next week. Well, what if this week is the week I need to go for my understanding and my learn kind of learning style? So I think there's lots of complexities, um, but I do think budgets are going to be impacted. We've already seen kind of furloughs and uh, layoffs and elimination of academic programs and uh, I think in kind of student affairs um, where I'm situated and where my, my research is situated, um, I think that's going to be interesting as well because some people see that um, as, you know, not essential to the academic mission, but I would argue that there's lots of theories and models and research that show us that if students are engaged in the co-curricular, they are more engaged in their academic studies. And so they really kind of go hand in hand. And so we also need to think about kind of what that means and, and counseling services fall under student affairs and health services fall under student affairs. And so if we're only cutting to student affairs, that could be, uh, you know, detrimental uh, to kind of students' sense of belonging, but also their health and safety on campus. And this is something in the forum, some of you have observed that we've been exploring this question of students' mental health being challenged and how universities can respond through mental health services. Uh, some of our participants have been very active on this, like Roxanne Riskin, uh, and we've had several guests looking into uh, all kind of, uh, uh, all kind of uh, dimensions for this. Uh, Friends, again, this is the time for uh, your questions uh, and your comments, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. We've already had, um, uh, in the chat, we've had an interesting conversation about the difference between American and European higher education. Um, uh, Apostolos uh, Kutropoulos mentioned that uh, European higher education has a lot less in the way of not just residential life, but the social mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Um, is this something that uh, um, uh, is really just uh, America is just a fluke this way, or is this a part of the secret sauce of American academic excellence? Yeah, um, I think that that's a great point and a great question. So, you know, we built our American model based off uh, some of the European models um, and that we expanded it and made it different. And so I think that um, it does, you know, create a different sense of connection to the campus, at least for some students. Um, and it's going to be different at different campuses. So uh, what that may mean for me as an undergraduate student, I went to Louisiana State University or LSU, and I have a deep connection to that campus. Uh, I got my PhD at NC State, and I have a lot of love for my experience there, but it was very different there as a doctoral student than it was for me as an undergraduate student. Um, and so I, you know, wear a lot more LSU stuff than I do NC State stuff because of my experience in the co-curriculum at LSU, um, as well as the big time sports and, you know, all of those sorts of things as well. But um, so I think that there there is some, you know, desire to have, and it doesn't have to be attending a concert or going to welcome week. For some students, it's attending academic based lectures. For other students, it's participating in undergraduate research. Mm -hmm. um, People can get connected in different ways, but I do think that some students do crave kind of the social experience where they meet their friends who are going to continue on with them into adulthood, or they meet people who uh, they attend, for example, uh, a Black Lives Matter protest on campus, and that kind of changes their trajectory of uh, their thoughts and, and actions. Um, and so I think all of those things are, are 
or critical, at least in the United States, to higher education, um, at least to some extent, right? I think if we eradicated it completely, so we, we wouldn't have the same kind of American higher education experience. We look at our two-year institutions as examples. They may perhaps have less in the co-curricular in terms of quantity, but that doesn't mean they have less in terms of quality of their co-curricular experience. And there are still student government at two-year institutions uh, where people kind of learn this process of, uh, you know, utilizing voice and, and positional power to make change on their campuses. And so I think a lot of those things are, in, in a lot of ways, cultivating the skills that a lot of our students are going to use post-degree. How can we reproduce that digitally? No, the the non-academic parts, the plays, the protests, the just meeting people purely by chance, uh, eating together, being in the same dorm. What, what are some of the ways that you've seen that we can most effectively reproduce that online? Yeah, so in the past couple of months, what we've seen is like, for example, I'll use the example of a campus programming board. So it's generally a, a, a board of students uh, who decide uh, or kind of vote on or represent their peers to determine uh, what concerts to bring to campus, what art demonstrations or art installations to bring to campus, what uh, kind of um, comedians or, or those sorts of things um, come to campus. And so what we've seen them do is uh, go more local and say, okay, well, we have X amount of bands who are in, for example, in Boone or near in the mountains somewhere. Um, and so we're going to live stream it. And so then all these people are coming into this live stream and still having this experience of attending a music event together, even if the band is live streaming out of their garage. Right. Um, so in some ways it's centered it on um, localization and what do we have locally that we can then bring uh, to our students. Um, I think for some of the other pieces around kind of cultural, uh, political, um, those art, those sorts of things, um, I think we can do that in virtual spaces as well, um, that we can bring students in and say, okay, well, we have, you know, um, a student organization who believes this and a student organization who believes that. And so how can we cultivate um, meaningful dialogue um, across um across those uh, viewpoints. Um, so I think there's still ways to do that. For some people that's not as engaging as being in, a, in a, the same physical space together, um, but it does get to the same, I think, ultimate goals, which is how are we expanding people's understanding of themselves in the world? Which is a great ultimate goal to pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate the optimism there uh, and the practicality as well. Um, and of course, just being a big fan of Appalachia, I, I love the idea of Appalachian local music. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, one question that's already come up from a long-term uh, supporter and fan of the uh, participant in the forum. This is Tom Ames coming to us from Houston. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Tom asks, uh, equity requires additional support for disadvantaged students. What about tutoring and other academic support services? Are you seeing those being cut? Uh, we haven't, I mean, maybe at some institutions, but um, overall, um, not yet. Um, in some ways we've seen those expanded um, because of the, understandings that um, obviously students have different opportunities. Um, and so, you know, while a lot of the literature will frame it as an achievement gap for some students and underserved populations, I would reframe that as an opportunity gap. It's not that students have less, less capacity or less ability, um, it's that they have not had the same opportunities um, as some of their peers um, on a campus. Like for example, um, I went to a small rural K-12 school. So I had no advanced placement. I had no international baccalaureate. We had no band. We had no art class. We had none of that. Mm. Um, and so that's an opportunity gap. It's not that I can't do those things. I can't play an instrument. But for the most part, like, there are things that I might have the ability to do, but I didn't have the ability to cultivate because there wasn't that opportunity. Um, and so I think about things like writing and math skills. And um, if some schools, K-12 schools or high schools, don't offer um, calculus, for example, then you might need um, to have some tutoring in calculus when you get to that course in your academic uh, trajectory. Um, and so we need to have those tutoring services. And so they have moved those appointments online, um, both for kind of academic support services, specifically like tutoring, like a writing center, math lab, those sorts of things. I would also encourage those folks on the forum who are faculty um, to also think about how we cultivate our classes that exacerbate those opportunity gaps. Um, and so we make uh, some assumptions that students come in that they know X, Y, and Z uh, based on, I would offer a more affluent white high schools. Um, and so how are we also understanding how we're cultivating the curriculum to either uh, decrease that opportunity gap or to further exacerbate it? Well, uh, an opportunity gap is a great way of uh, framing this. Um, and I really appreciate that. Um, do you, um, I, 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 more questions, but if you're new to the forum, friends, uh, what we just hit, did here with Tom's question, that's the perfect example of using the question mark button. And we have a couple more questions that are in the queue right now. Um, and again, you can see that uh, Dr. Ardoin is uh, very, very generous and kind in answering questions, and she hasn't bitten anybody's head off yet. Although, you know, we have some time. 
Um, we have uh, another question that just came in, uh, and this is from awesome, awesome uh, Mark Corbett Wilson, coming to us from California, who says, the majority of California community college students are adults and are only on campus for classes. Then adds, in my experience, most tenured faculty have been resistant to online classes. Uh, and the question that follows it, this guy briefly cut off, but he adds, uh, how will community colleges provide quality education since so many of the faculty are adjunct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's also a challenge right now um, in, we, we talked about budget a little bit earlier, but we're seeing some campuses who are um, not renewing contracts uh, for yeah. part-time or, um, you know, contingent faculty in, in different capacities, uh, which I think is a, a huge challenge because I think that uh, in higher education, we have at two year and four year institutions, we have grown to depend on uh, our contingent faculty um, and we have not treated them well uh, holistically. And so I think that we expect them to do a lot. Um, and then in some ways, uh, they become the first people to be released um, or not renewed uh, because of the status of their of their position line and those sorts of things. Um, I do think that we see more adult learners across um, higher education, or I, I like to call them like, um, you know, people who are coming back for a second career, right? It might look different um, at, for different institutions or different parts of the country. But um, I think that um, for faculty who are resistant to online learning, obviously COVID has pushed them uh, to learn some kind of skills. And so I had colleagues that I've worked with who um, had never even used a kind of learning management system. Um, and so they had to learn how to do that in two weeks uh, because we had to go online for COVID. And so I think some people are going to start to um, elevate their skill set um, or, or um, bring it up kind of to speed, if you will, uh, with some of the online platforms. And so that's more complicated at some institutions because there isn't uh, necessarily the teaching support structures um, that might exist or the IT support structures um, in terms of um, both hardware and software. And so I think that can be more complicated, uh, perhaps at two-year institutions, depending on their funding structure, um, or even regional publics who may be having some funding um, challenges as well. So I think that we have to encourage faculty to look at different modalities of teaching and learning um, and to keep up with their skill set in those areas and to learn who their students are and what their students need. Um, and so we may say, I prefer to teach face to face. OK, I just do. I prefer to teach face to face. And, you know, we are still kind of on, on the fence about what we're going to do this fall, because it may not be best, even though I want to teach face to face and students might want to learn face to face. That might not be the best thing for any of us. Um, and so how do we also understand what our students needs are? And if your students are adult learners and you know that their needs are to teach online, if they have the access to the things they need to learn online, then how are you responding to those needs? So it's not just about what I want as a faculty member. It's yeah. generally not about that at all. It's about what do the students need in order for their learning. Well, let's let's think about that in a, in a very practical way for a second. How do we learn about these students? I, I mean, that is, um, you know, we don't. Um, we have a lot of national surveys um, that look at a, at a broad macro level that are very useful, um, but polling students to find out things like what's your home broadband speed? Um, you know, do you have a, a video uh, capable uh, laptop? Uh, what do you think about online learning versus face-to-face? -face? Um, what do you miss about it? I mean, how is this where every institution should survey and poll their students? Is, are there ways of doing this that you'd recommend? Yeah, so I think um, some, you're, we are seeing some institutions do that right now um, as they make decisions about the fall semester. Uh, they are surveying students, they're surveying faculty, they're surveying administrators and staff. So basically they're surveying the campus community to figure out uh, what is the best way to move forward in sort of this um, complex kind of situation we find ourselves in. Um, even campuses who have already definitively made a decision haven't definitively made a decision. And so um, they are doing all this kind of on the back end. I would also offer that as a faculty member, I can I know who's in my class for the fall. I can see who's registered. And so I can take on the responsibility as a faculty member. And not all faculty want to do that. That's okay. their choice. I don't necessarily agree. But I, you know, I could survey the students and ask them just for the classes that I am responsible for managing um, and talk to them about what their needs are and those sorts of things. And so I would say that's a lot harder if you're teaching a 300 person lecture um, at a, you know, an institution than it is if you're teaching a 25 student seminar. Um, but uh, I would say it's our responsibility to get to know who our students are, because otherwise I don't think we're serving them well. I think we're just uh, sharing information with them. How can um I mean, individual, you stepping back, I mean, it seems in general, COVID or not, online or not, it seems, of course, incumbent upon instructors to get to know their students. Um, you know, if you don't do that, I don't think you should be instructed. But um, how can an institution uh, best support this? Uh, I mean, 
think that if, I think in, well, like I said, I think some institutions are doing broad surveys. I think um, you know, for institutions that uh, some of their faculty might have different skill sets in terms of you know creating surveys or like those sorts of things, they could create a generalized um, kind of survey that they could be tweaked uh, for each individual class. So, for example. Um, something like the, you know, Institutional Research Office or the Teaching and Learning Center, if those are capacity, you know, things that exist on the campus can say, you know, here are the baseline things you should be asking, but then allow for the tweaking of it. Um, and you can do those surveys if you have a learning management system, you could do a Google form. Uh, there's different ways that you could do it uh, at little to zero, you know, little to no cost um, to you as a faculty member um, to be able to get some of that information. I have colleagues who on the first day of class ask students to fill out, um, you know, a specific form to give them information about those students uh, to, the, to the extent the students want to share, obviously. Um, but I think that's important. Uh, those are great ways forward. Uh, thank you. Um, it, and if uh, uh, if you all have questions that you would like to add, uh, again, it's um, uh, really easy to do, uh, either by typing the question mark um, box or by clicking the raised hand button. And as I say that, we have another question uh, that just came up from Scott Ranke at Ball State. Uh, and Scott asks, for first generation students, what types of campus engagement or which data points have you been most predictive of student success or failure? And are there ways that this differs for transfer students? Mm -hmm. mm, good question, Scott. That's a really broad question. I don't know that I would say anything's predictive. I would say things have been shown to be more helpful or less helpful, but I don't think that it predicts student success or failure. Um, I think it can, um, you know, advance or you know, progress student success. Um, and so part of that is how we share information. So um, I have a book, and some of my recent um, research too is on specifically college knowledge and university jargon. Um, and so if we are putting out applications, like, you know, applications to apply to the university, scholarship applications, uh, res life, whatever, any kind of information we're sending out about the institution, uh, and it includes all this jargon that is very higher ed specific, um, mm -hmm. as well as acronyms that only make sense to people who are on that campus, uh, yeah. then we are not uh, help helping progress student success. Mm -hmm. uh, you're actually creating a lot of barriers uh, to student success by doing that. And we've seen some shifting of that. So. Um, the Chronicle wrote an article about this last summer, um, but how institutions are starting to make sense of um, creating these kind of dictionaries for their specific campus. It's exacerbated for transfer students because if you are at institution A and kind of get a handle on the lingo, um, the acronyms and the jargon, and then you move to institution B, and that is new layers of jargon that's complicated because we have US higher ed based jargon, we have institution based jargon, and then within each academic unit, we have jargon. With each student affairs unit, we have jargon. And so as a student, I'm trying to make sense of all that, particularly as a first gen student. So I can't call my mom and say, you know, what does X, what does FAFSA mean? My mom doesn't know what FAFSA means. Um, and so I think um, decoding, if you will, um, all of that jargon, um, I think is helpful. Um, the Center for First Generation Student Success, which is a uh, collaboration between NASPA, which is a student affairs organization, and the Souter Foundation um, has also doing some amazing work around kind of these measures that um, assist first generation students with success um, and uh, retention and graduation. Uh, they did a four year landscape analysis um, looking at everything from how are different institutions defining first gen uh, to how are institutions getting resources to support students. And so that's everything from developing specific centers. So like Brown University has a center specifically for um, first gen students, undocumented students and low income students. Um, as well as other institutions have some, sort of these centers as well. Um, other institutions, UCLA, for example, doc, Dr. Uh, Latanya Reese Miles um, is using some amazing work over there. Um, and they have a specific number of staff who are, who are dedicated to supporting first gen students. Uh, other campuses don't have those kind of resources. And so they are developing student organizations that focus on first gen students that let first gen students meet other first gen students. There are bridge programs outside of the federally funded TRIO programs, other kinds of bridge programs that are homegrown at institutions. Uh, examples like the University of Florida um, as a kind of a scholarship program that does some of this work. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, the center is also doing a two year landscape analysis. So for those of you who are at community colleges, uh, that one should be released this fall. Um, those are free and downloadable for you. If you um, Google the Center for First Gen Student Success, uh, you can find all of that. Plus, they post tons of research and news articles specifically dedicated to first gen students. I think the only problem that uh, all of these projects have is they don't have the ability to come up with great titles um, like 
uh, your paper. Um, so if you haven't seen this in the chat, the title is, It's All a Bunch of BS. <laughs> How institutional jargon creates in-groups and out-groups in higher education. Yes. Um, but uh, but thank you. That's a, that's a fantastically rich uh, answer. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really great question. Uh, and thank you, Scott. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and again, if you're Ball State, uh, you know, rural students, are, it's a huge issue for your university as well. Uh, we have um, a whole bunch of questions that are coming up. Uh, we have uh, one video question from uh, Ophelia Mangan at uh, Columbia. So let me see if I can bring her up on stage. Sure. Hello, Ophelia. Thanks for having me up. Um, so I, I'm a first generation college student and I, I'm also a Gates Millennium Scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who don't know, starting in the year 2000, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation made a gift and for 17 years, they funded up to a thousand scholars uh, for up to 10 years of full funding, tuition, books, room, board and expenses. Um, easily changed the whole trajectory of my life. Um, and I had the honor to, to be in some different leadership positions with the organization um, as it grew and, and expanded to serve students, many of whom were first generation students as well. And uh, by the time I got to grad school, uh, GMS had sort of recognized that there were some institutional, um, you know, at each institution, there were some issues that were kind of cross cutting for the individual scholars. And we worked to create what we, they decided to call the campus based leadership programs so that the scholars at any given institution could come together for a community to help uh, work, help each other out with, you know, some administrative issues. And it was only in that process that some really key and very important things came to light. So just a, one example uh, was some students, the, the scholarship monies were coming to the university after some key deadlines and students were getting dropped from their courses, which is obviously a problem for matriculation. And these are students who have financial need, who couldn't just pay the tuition bill to make sure that they have kept their registration. You can see where it went from there. And it was happy multiple times. We were able to identify this and coordinate. So my question for you is, what is happening in the terms of conversation between your institution and students there to really create a space where um, where people who may be having similar types of issues can really work together and join forces um, to figure out the bureaucracy, figure out solutions, communicate with administrators, rather than having it all be a one-to-one -one or self-identified uh, type of process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I can't really speak to how Appalachian State specifically is doing that because um, I haven't been a part of those conversations. Um, and uh, I mostly reside in the faculty space, not in the, well, not at all in the administrative space at this point uh, in kind of my career pathway. Um, but I will say that on the national level, that does happen. So I just mentioned the Center for First Gen Student Success. Uh, that is happening in that space. And so there are, um, a, a consortium, if you will, um, of what's called uh, first forward institutions, uh, which are both two year and four year institutions kind of across, uh, they're on their second cohort um, of this kind of program. There's, I think between 60 and 80, it varies by year, uh, institutions who are part of this. And it kind of creates a block uh, to for folks to come and say here, and here are issues that we're having at our institution um, around first generation college student status and what are um, being barriers. So things uh, particularly around drop ad, uh, we saw a lot of these issues also exacerbated with COVID, but um, around, uh, you know, when can people take W's, when can they not, uh, you know, all of those sorts of kind of academic uh, policy pieces. Um, but then also, what does it look like across um, in terms of fundraising? Uh, how do we work with our fundraising office or our advancement office uh, to specifically cultivate uh, financial gifts that can go to support uh, first generation college students or rural students or uh, students of color, you know, et cetera, uh, specific populations of students um, so that we can get uh, more direct um, services, staff lines, et cetera, to serve those student populations. Um, so I think some of those spaces, there's also a um, conferences on student success that NASPA hosts and a, a slice of it, it's like a five, um, five, I guess, component conference. Um, but one of those is specifically on uh, first generation college students. And so a lot of folks who study first gen students who uh, his job either directly or tangentially relates to uh, supporting those populations on campus are coming together um, to say, okay, well, this seems to be an issue on my campus. It's also an issue on my campus. Um, and how are we looking at scalability of programs and services? Um, so I don't know how it's happening necessarily on individual campus. I see it more kind of on the broader uh, base of across higher education in the U.S. 
Well, that's heartening to hear that those efforts are are certainly in place, and um, and I'll I'll stay tuned to your research uh, as it develops. So that, and as you see, I think it is incredibly important, um, you know, for for scholars to connect. And I think most institutions are even smaller, you know, community and rural colleges. There are an incredible wealth of resources available. Um, the hardest part sometimes is actually knowing that they exist and figuring out where where to access them. So thanks for your work. Yeah, and I think also to your point, I think we also have to think about how are we collaborating on campus across programs and services because sometimes tutoring is happening in the TRIO program and tutoring is happening in the tutoring center and tutor is happening in the African American Cultural Center, but we haven't connected those dots either. And so uh, sometimes students feel uh, funneled into one specific space and they could be getting assistance across all of those spaces. Um, so it's not just kind of from the national level, but also even how are we uh, organizing and collaborating on campus so that students understand the buffet, if you will, uh, of resources available to them. And then we can also then notice where the gaps are uh, in terms of those support structures. Absolutely, well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, thanks for your question. And uh, again, if you're, if you're new to the forum, uh, this, is, uh, this is how video chat works and video questions work. So if you'd like to follow Ophelia, who is awesome and always asks great questions, we're glad to see you, Ophelia. And again, Sonia, thank you, what a fantastic answer. Uh, I hadn't thought about the, you know, the problem of trying to sort being funneled into one particular set of services at a campus, especially a larger one uh, like Appalachia State. We have more questions that are just piling in, and they're coming from and they're hitting different topics in different areas. So I want to make sure we get a chance to uh, explore them all. Here's one from Kathy Pittman at Hillsborough Community College, who says that instructors have been already struggling to reach students due to the coronavirus pandemic. How do we help them work through their feelings about the protests and police killing without being in person? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it's something we as educators need to specifically be asking ourselves. And so, uh, and I think it's multi-layered. Um, so I'll give you an example. So uh, I posted via social media a couple weeks ago, you know, if folks need re reading recommendations and by no means am I an expert, but um, reading recommendations for um, around kind of white supremacy or uh, social justice or, uh, you know, racial injustice in the United States that I would be happy to offer them things I've read, um, as well as um, put a call out to if you want to collaborate, let me know. And I had a colleague, uh, she is at the University of Arizona, uh, Dr. Z. Nicolazzo, uh, who did reach out to me and said, hey, um, you know, what do you think about let's have a chat about what we can do. And so uh, we organized um, kind of a, you know, a, a white educators for Black Lives Matter or racial racial justice a kind of reading group. And so we've had, you know, 500 plus people who've signed up and we're doing all the organization on the back end and splitting people into small groups. But part of what we also recognize is that as white educators, we have to uh, be reading, um, you know, all this literature and then not only reading it, but making it actionable into our pedagogy and practice. Um, and so what does that mean as I redevelop my courses for the fall semester? Um, everything from, you know, who am I assigning to readings and to how am I uh, providing some autonomy in how students do assignments so that uh, they can, you know, more readily identify with their learning process um, to, you know, also thinking about one of my colleagues emailed me today uh, that they are hosting a processing space for both uh, the recent alums that just graduated in May from our, our master's program, um, as well as incoming students to process what is happening. Because as educators, particularly for our graduate students, uh, they're pro processing for themselves as students, but then they are also tasked with helping undergraduate students or other graduate students process in their role as graduate assistants and administrators. And so it's this multi-layered piece. And so I think we have to uh, provide spaces for uh, caucusing work, um, which I learned at the Social Justice Training Institute, which basically is how are we working within our racial groups? So how are white folks educating other white folks? How are folks um, recently? Mm -hmm. In diverse issues today, uh, two of my colleagues, Dr. Nicole Garcia, who's at Rutgers, and Dr. Claudia Garcia-Lewis, who's at the University of Texas San Antonio, wrote about what does it mean to um, to face kind of uh, anti-Black uh, racism in the Latinx community, particularly if you're Afro-Latinx. Um, you know, what does it mean for folks who are Indigenous or Asian American? Some of our colleagues, Dr. Rosie Perez and some other folks, um, held a space for Asian American individuals to talk about what does it mean to be fighting for racial justice as an Asian American in the United States. So I think we need to do some caucusing and some in-group work. And then I think we also need to, to do across race work um, and do processing that way as well. And I've thought about that a lot. I'm teaching a social justice course in the fall. And so how am I going to create space that we can process um, you know, this time in the United States, which again is not new, right? We have been fighting police brutality and the murder of black individuals uh, since the 
you know, inset before the United States really was incepted. But so I think all of that is important. Um, and I think we need some of our own work as well, because even if we think that we are educated on race and social justice issues, we have more to learn. We always have more to learn. And so I think we have to do self work. We have to do caucusing work within our racial identified groups. And then we have to do work across race as well. And that's all that we have to work on uh, often remotely. Yes. yes. Kathy, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you'd like to follow up, please, please do. Uh, we have uh, one more question coming in from the already named uh, Roxanne Briskin. So let me put Roxanne's uh, question up here for everyone to see. Do you envision the role of the library is important in providing any enhanced support services for students? And do you see these as priority in assisting faculty too? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and I will always say, uh, so I'm a huge fan of libraries, um, university libraries, public libraries. Uh, I love books. I um, My grandmother who had a middle grades education brought me to the library every Monday in the summer. Um, and it really became my space for, for learning and thoughts and ideas. And I maintain that to be true. Um, and so, the university library has been critical uh, in my work as a faculty member, both in my research and obtaining literature um, to do research and, and writing work, but also in uh, being able to get access um, and get students access to the readings for my, my courses. In fact, I won't assign something if the library doesn't have it in their holdings, uh, because I want students to not have a, a financial barrier um, to be able to do the readings for class. Um, and so I've worked with our librarians in that capacity. I also think that uh, our libraries, um, and we've, we've seen this with bookstores, um, and some black owned bookstores have actually uh, put out um, social media and, and news articles about this, that they're getting flooded right now, uh, particularly from people wanting very specific books. And so um, how our libraries also creating in their holdings, um, great, uh, you know, multiple copies or eBooks or journals, um, specifically that focus on uh, black scholars and black authors um, and, and their work and elevating their work, but then also um, how are they building that in so that people can access that from multiple, whether it's when the libraries open back and they can actually go get a physical copy or they can find it online. Um, but I do think libraries are critical. Uh, actually, LSU, my undergraduate institution announced today that they're actually renaming the library, um, which I'm very proud of, um, that uh, the black student leaders on campus, both current and former, um, have fought uh, to do that, um, to rename the library, and they are going to do that. Um, and one of the things I suggested to some colleagues at LSU was, okay, well, in the renaming, can we also create special collections that feature uh, black authors from Louisiana or from L who are LSU alums. And so um, how are we also um, centering, I guess, if you will, um, that there are many ways of knowing, there are many scholars and brilliant people um, that are people of color and particularly black and African-American individuals. So I do think the library is critical. Well, that's a, I mean, here, here. I mean, we have, uh, this this program is unashamedly a, a huge library fan base. Um, we uh, we address libraries a lot. If you're in the chat, friends, I just shared a, uh, a link to the uh, Ithaca SNR study from 2018, the C-class study, where they were taking a look at how community colleges can provide non-traditional -li non library, library resources, uh, everything from uh, tech support to financial aid to political assistance. Um, so again, that, that's a great question, Roxanne, and uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I will add too, um, to mention, yeah, you um, sparked something in my brain too, is around like technology and access. So as I thought about doing like video uh, journaling or um, assignments that required students to uh, use technology, I also made sure the library had that as well. Um, and that it was accessible to students because if we were requiring to use all this technology, we can't assume that students have um, the ability to access that kind of technology. And so utilizing that component of the library too, I think is also critical. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Friends, we are down to our last nine minutes somehow. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that happened. So I wanna make sure that you all get a chance to uh, put in your questions. Uh, so if you'd like us to be talking about uh, everything from comparisons with international uh, campuses, if you'd like us to think about particular technologies, if you'd like us to address economics, uh, demographics, religion, any other aspect of the changing student experience, uh, this is a remarkable opportunity to uh, ask a remarkable scholar. While people are thinking about that, I, I'd like to um, put in one question myself. Uh, depending on how we define it right now, we are in the middle of a recession. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like, again, depending on our forecasting models, that this is going to continue through the summer. <coughs> uh, fall semester is going to see a um, uh, perhaps a, a cramped student, I'm uh, oh, sorry, a cramped state budget environment. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens to so many students who are either hit directly, uh, that is they've lost a job right now, uh, or their family members have lost jobs. Um, they're 
working through college in an atmosphere of, uh, of great economic constraint. Uh, how does this COVID-driven uh, economic crisis going to impact students? Yeah, I think there um, people often make the assumption that, uh, you know, a response will be that students will stop out um, or not attend um, right. depending on kind of where they were in their trajectory. Um, and I think for some people that's absolutely true. I think that, um, you know, if you, for example, if I'm in a family that, uh, you know, one of my um, caregivers um, has lost their job and I still have my job, then I'm going to feel compelled probably yeah. to work more hours and contribute to my family. So that might be true. Um, we may have some other folks who say, well, I can't find a job. I just recently graduated. I can't find a job. Um, and so they might actually go back to school um, as a financial uh, strategy um, because they might be eligible for specific loans or grants or, you know, different kinds of things. And so uh, I, I actually have talked to some folks who said, you know, I might go back to grad school or go back for a second degree, uh, undergraduate degree, um, because or training of some kind at a, a, right. you know, a technical institution. Institute um, in order to have access to that funding. Um, and so I think there's different strategies. And historically in higher ed, we've seen when there is a recession that we do see more people going back to school, either for a different type of training or for graduate school or those sorts of things. Um, so I think, I don't know if it's going to be a teeter totter, right? That we're going to have some people stop out uh, to contribute economically to their families or because they don't have the funding to pay tuition, those sorts of things, uh, with the other lever uh, being that. Um, people might be using that as a funding outlet um, or a retooling of their skill set uh, to be able to go into a different sector. Uh, it's a, a, a teeter-totter is a good way of putting it. Um, and it's going to vary depending on, uh, on, on where we go. Uh, in the chat box, uh, Tom Hames calls the next stimulus bill to fund students, which mm -hmm. I think almost everybody here would say that's a good idea. Um, but we may also wonder about its likelihood of occurring. Um, while people are just hitting their, their last questions, um, let me ask a, a kind of spinoff of this one. Looking at the whole panoply of services that higher education offers, everything from uh, you know su research support to libraries, technology, classes, what do you think is most likely to get cut come this fall? Well, we've already seen athletics, um, which is interesting because a, a lot of campuses, well, depending on the campus, athletics may or may not be an auxiliary. Um, and so the money is in different buckets, if you will, or different streams. And so sometimes, um, you know, people call for athletics and say, we'll just cut it all because it'll all come back to the university. It doesn't quite always work like that. Um, but we have seen multiple uh, institutions, some in the state of North Carolina, uh, who have cut some of their um, athletic programs um, in order to save money. And so I think uh, those are not going to be generally your football, baseball, basketball uh, kinds of um, sports. But um, so I think that's we've seen that sort of happen. Uh, we have seen some layoffs um, of um, some of our like custodial grounds uh, dining staff, um, which uh, depending on what happens for fall, they, those folks might be able to get rehired. But um, so we're starting to see some of the construction perhaps stop or at least pause uh, for now. Um, so some of those kind of building, dining, um, custodial will, will be interesting because there's going to be an increased need for cleaning um, due to COVID. So that might be a different kind of space. Um, dining uh, may or may not come back depending on what happens um, with residence life or if people like at a community college just says we're not going to have dining on our campus uh, as a COVID measure. Um, so I think that's going to be interesting. And we, we have also seen um, some layoffs of both student affairs um, administrators as well as contingent faculty positions. Um, right. So, uh, But then I wonder who's taking on all those responsibilities because the responsibilities yep. don't just stop. Uh, somebody still has to teach that class. Somebody still has to, uh, you know, inf you know, regulate Title IX on our campuses. Um, and so what does that mean and look like, especially because a lot of the student affairs positions are tied to some kind of state or federal policy measure. Um, and so things like Title IX or things like conduct or some of those things have to happen on our campuses. And we know historically that student affairs was created because faculty didn't want to do those things. Right. Um, so, you know, how, how are we going to manage some of those? So I think that Institutions are going to start to say what is not mission critical, but I think depending on who you ask, what is mission critical shifts. Uh, uh, and that may vary, of course, from institution to institution. Yes. Uh, it may vary in a great in a, a great series of ways. Um, we have oh no, that's that's a good answer. Um, and I, I fear for everyone that you mentioned, for just about everyone you mentioned, I thought, oh, and that's going to hurt students. You know, that's going to hurt the student experience. Um, you know, if we, if, if, and not to mention the humane, the humanitarian cost of, uh, of, of losing all of this. Uh, we have um, a question that came in from Twitter. It was a great question or a comment, and I want to make sure, see if I've imported it correctly here. 
Uh, let's see if this works. Uh, yes, this is from Ellen uh, Nuffer. And, uh, and she says, uh, survey questions and student answers will or should change as the fall semester approaches and we continue to learn more about COVID itself, mm -hmm. testing and transmission, and the timing matters here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that seems like a really, really good point. Um, do you have any uh, any suggestions about how we can think about this? Yeah, I think it's extremely critical because um, we don't want to be in a position where uh, we say, okay, we're going back face to face. And then a week before the semester starts, we say, oh, just kidding. We're moving everything online again, right? Because that doesn't give us time to appropriately right. plan to create learning experiences, both curricular and co-curricular for students that are meaningful um, and thoughtfully planned. Um, and so, you know, we want to wait as long as possible to make the most informed decision that we can in terms of uh, contract contact tracing, in terms of temperatures, in terms of, yeah. uh, you know, kind of space, yeah. space looks like all of those sorts of things. Um, so we want to wait as long as we can. And we don't want to wait too long to where we find ourselves in a similar situation to what we were in March, which is we are just, um, you know, spinning our wheels trying to make something happen so that we can continue operation. Um, so I think it's going to be a it's going to be a delicate balance between waiting as long as we can, but not waiting too long uh, to where we can't allow ourselves time to adequately and thoughtfully respond. That's a great, great answer. Uh, and, and Ellen, thank you uh, for the uh, fantastic response, uh, for the fantastic prompt. Uh, we have uh, one more question, um, and then I think we're going to need to wrap up. And this is coming from Charles Findlay. Uh, and uh, Charles asks us to, uh, aren't we seeing additional burdens pushed to faculty with no compensation to cope? Yes. Um, and I would argue that we're doing also we're doing that with student affairs staff. We're doing that sometimes with our uh, custodial folks. I mean, we're doing that with all kinds of people. We're doing that with people who are parents or caregivers right now uh, who are doing, you know, more than double duty. And so uh, I hear that 100 percent as a faculty member who, uh, you know, I'm a nine month employee and I'm working throughout the summer because that's what I'm going to have to do to get things done. And so. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, and I'm not sure if we truly want to serve students and maintain kind of the um, ethical obligation we have as educators that we cannot not do that. That's just uh, one more thing to do. That's kind of liberal arts approach. Here's the last question I have, and, and, and I try to end on a, on a future oriented question. And this is a future administrative question, which is, if a, if a college or university is going to be doing all that you've described, I mean, the careful balancing of, of finances, the trying to help faculty along the way to teach better, uh, trying to really reconnect with students to learn their experiences and support them in different ways, while coping with the changing environment of the pandemic, um, what kind of administrative shift do you see? I mean, that is, it's almost like we're in a kind of emergency footing um, or a war footing or campuses. I, I, are you seeing like, I don't know what to call it, like COVID-19 emergency committees or something like um, Yeah, we absolutely are. So both at the university level, as well as the individual kind of unit level. So whether that is like, for example, for us, the College of Education, uh, or it might be the Division of Student Affairs, those sorts of things. So you're seeing, uh, you know, even within housing and residence life, they have their own committees. And so um, we're seeing all of that happen. Um, and then we're also seeing that, uh, you know, across professional associations. Um, so different professional associations are also talking about what this means. Uh, I have a colleague that developed a crisis management class last summer, is also teaching it again this summer, um, and has good enrollments because essentially what we're doing right now is just managing crises. Um, and so we, we do that on a normal basis in kind of higher ed and student affairs, but it's, it's again, amplified uh, right now as well. And so we're just trying to figure out how do we make it to and through the next semester uh, to the place where we hope that we get... Um, back to um, a semblance of things that um, are more steady. Um, so I think we're going to continue to operate in kind of a crisis mode, in my opinion, uh, throughout the fall semester. Um, and we do, we are seeing administrative responses to getting committees um, so that we can get responses from students, faculty, and staff. There's been multiple surveys uh, that have come out asking for our perspective and opinion on kind of what fall looks like. Um, and again, professional associations are doing that as well. So again, we're seeing it at the unit kind of program program department, college level, across the university, and then across higher ed through professional associations. Wow. Well, I, I can think of uh, very, very, very few people um, on earth who are better equipped to not only answer the question as well as you just did, uh, but also to track it uh, for the next year. Uh, I mean, we're really seeing something uh, extraordinary emerge. Uh, 
Professor Aldron, you've been fantastic. You have just generously answered people's questions um, and they've come from all directions and you've been so, so helpful. Mm -hmm. Let me ask, if anyone needs any help in uh, creating the perfect title for a paper, I'm sorry, if they want to follow your research um, uh, moving ahead, uh, mm -hmm. what is the best way for keeping up with all of your work? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I do have uh, a personal website, which is just my name, uh, sanjaardwin.com. So S O N J A A R D O I N.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I am on Twitter. Um, and so that's just at Sanja Ardwin, which is my name. Uh, so I do put stuff there as well. Oh, great. Oh, that's excellent. Uh, well, a bunch of us have been uh, tweeting away. Uh, I don't know if anyone used your handle, so you might want to look for the hashtag FTTE. Um, but in the meantime, thank you again. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, keep up the great work. Uh, I, I envy your students the experience of working with you this fall. Absolutely. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And thanks to everybody for participating and for all you're doing uh, for the students, uh, kind of uh, wherever you are. Oh, well said. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. But don't go away, folks, because I need to uh, point out uh, where things are headed next. Uh, and my trusty cat sidekick, uh, Spider, will be here to help. Uh, so first of all, uh, for the next two months, uh, we're going to be continuing to cover the future of higher education by hitting a whole series of topics. Again, coming up, uh, the changing demographics, uh, improving teaching, the impact of public universities, uh, high flex teaching, and more looking at the impact of COVID-19. Now, if you'd like to keep talking about this, uh, Twitter is a great way of doing it. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, as you can see right here. We also have groups on Facebook and LinkedIn and Slack. Um, and if you want to go into our archive, our archive is completely up to date, uh, has more than 205 recordings. So please just head there and just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Uh, and above all, in all of this, stay safe. Um, really take care of yourselves. Thank you all for your great participation today. And we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.